Jeremiah, can you hear me now? Jeremiah 17, 5 to 8. It is good to see you. Glad you can hear me, and it's good that we can be together and to worship. A few months ago, I, I didn't know that I would be here to preach because Tammy got a little upset with me. Uh, she had gone to do some Christmas shopping on a Saturday afternoon. Came back with her haul. She took it to her bedroom. She wrapped everything and brought some things out and put under the tree. Then it was time for me to review my sermon for the next day. So she goes back in her bedroom, watches TV, so I can review my sermon. Well, that gave me the time to snoop. And so I got under the tree and I found something with my name on it. Well, she had just taken a box and put a little bit of ribbon around it to hold it together. So I can take that ribbon off and I open that box up and there's a gorgeous sweater. Not as gorgeous as I am, but the sweater was gorgeous. Wasn't funny. And um, just a gorgeous sweater. So I put it all back together and I get the ribbon right back and I put it under the tree. And as we're going to bed that night, I look at her and say, I love that sweater. Thank you so much. She said, I can't believe you did that. I trusted you. I would never have done that myself. Now, Folks, there are two problems with that statement. One, she would have more than she would have been more than happy to have done that if she were on the other foot. All right? She snoops, she looks, she tries her best every single year. And second, next month, we'll have been married 25 years. She knows my antics. All right? She knows she could not trust me with a gift like that. I, I was surprised she didn't wrap it or do something to where I couldn't get in. I don't know how much she trusted me not to get into that gift, to be honest. I don't care what she says or how much she protests. I don't know how much she trusted me. And you know the truth. There are people in this world whom we simply cannot trust. You've trusted people who have hurt you severely. Maybe it was a doctor whom you trusted with a diagnosis or a treatment and did harm to your health rather than helped it. Maybe it was some politician you trusted and you voted for him or her. Things didn't go the way you thought they were going to go. Maybe you trust your kid with your car. And the scratch on the side of it shows your folly. Maybe you trusted an employer. You got that pink slip. Maybe you put your lunch in the fridge at work and you come back and somebody else has taken it and helped himself to your lunch. Maybe you trust a spouse. Infidelity. Hurtful words, rage, broke your heart in a million pieces. You know the truth. People can't be trusted. And this text in Jeremiah reminds us that people cannot be trusted. You see, the people in Judah have missed Placed their trust. They've misplaced their trust big time. They followed idols. Jeremiah 16, 18. They have polluted my land with the carcasses of their detestable idols. The people trusted in idols, and God says, wait a minute. That's detestable. Jeremiah 17, 2. Their children remember their altars and their shirim beside every green tree and on the high hills. Think about that statement. 
their children remember their idols and to share them on every high hill. Your children have been taught, trained, brought up with these idols. Just commonplace. People couldn't be trusted. And because they've trusted in these idols rather than Yahweh, the people are going to go into captivity. Jeremiah 17, 3b to 4. The Lord says, Your wealth and all your treasures I will give for spoil as the price of your high places for sin throughout all your territory. You shall loosen your hand from your heritage that I gave you, and I will make you serve your enemies in a land you do not know. For in my anger a fire is kindled that shall burn forever. That statement gets me. Your hand's going to loosen from that land. Almost like you're holding on to it. Trying to keep it. But God says it's not going to work. Your hand's going to loosen from that land I gave you. They would go to captivity. Now, here's the question. Why would God go from talking about their trust in idols to our text where he talks about trusting in men? It seems a strange progression to go from their misplaced trust in all these idols and the Shiram and worshiping them on the high places and then go and tell them they don't need to trust men. Well, think about it for a second. When the Babylonians came against Judah, there would be two temptations the people would face. One, they might with trust in that army of Judah. Oh, their army will save them. They can stand up to the Babylonians. And if that did not work, some foreign power will come to our rescue. Just like today. Nations in antiquity made alliances and allies. You read about that all through Scripture. This king and that king and this king getting together and pulling their armies and going and attacking this town or that town. Quite common. And so maybe they would think, we'll get all these other people to come to our rescue and save us. They put their trust to military might, power of armies, rather than trusting in God. As you look at the text, one idea, one truth stands head and shoulders above everything else. It becomes crystal clear. And that is, that trust in God is greater than trust in man. Trust in God is greater than trust in man. Jeremiah 17, 5 to 8. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his drink, his arm, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Uh, the one who trusts in man who makes flesh, humans, his strength, 
Hebrew, his arm, his strength. Heart turns away from the Lord like a shrub in the desert. Well, there's no hope for that shrub in the desert. It's going to die. It's going to wither. It's, it's not going to have any water. It's going to die. No hope for it. Oh, he, he's going to be like a man in the parched places of the wilderness. Uninhabited salt land. Many places in the Middle East are salty ground. Dead sea and all around it and places like that. Well, nothing's going to grow there. There, there. There's no hope for growth. No hope for life. The one who trusts in God is like the plant there. Without hope, nothing. Not going to survive. But verse 7, Blessed is the man who trusts the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought for it does not cease to bear fruit. And you see, the one who trusts in God is, is not like a shrub in the desert. Okay? He's like this tree by the water. Oh, it sends roots down deep, finds that water, feast on that water. The heat of summer, even in Houston, is it going to bother it? It's going to have all this green. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to grow. It's going to thrive. Even in a year of drought, it's going to thrive. Why? Because it has those deep roots. It is firm. It is immovable. The one who trusts in God is like that. And as the Babylonian army came against Judah, the people needed to hear that. They needed to understand, don't trust in these armies. Don't trust in your own power to withstand these Babylonians. It's not going to work, folks. You're going into captivity. God has decreed it. God has said it. It's as good as done. Forget it. Trust in God. There's where your salvation rests. See, trusting in God is greater than trusting in man. But as I stand here this morning, I, I, I'm not stupid. I know that you knew that before you got out of bed this morning. You know that trusting God is greater than trusting man. That's why you're here this morning. You trust in God. And so I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the need to trust God. You know that need. You believe in that need. You want to trust in God. And so here's where I want us to go this morning. How do you learn to trust in God instead of man? How can you in your own life learn to trust God with everything you have and not trust in man? We're tempted to trust in men, to trust that politician, to trust that doctor, to trust that brother or sister in Christ, to trust our spouse. And at times, every one of those will disappoint us. And if we put all our eggs in that basket, we'll just be disappointed, left heartbroken. If we trust in God, we can have confidence. Never be disappointed. So how do you move from 
trusting in man to trusting in God. Well, first of all, you need to think about what trusting in man really means. Okay, if you're going to trust in God rather than man, you need to give some thought about what trusting in men really means. Think about men who simply could not be trusted. Some men could not be trusted. In the context of Jeremiah 17, you have people who cannot be trusted. The nation as a whole cannot be trusted. At verse 1, Jeremiah, speaking for God, said their sins are engraved on their hearts. Think about that. Instead of the law engraved on tablets of stone, their sins are engraved on their hearts. Verse 2. Parents can't be trusted. Their children have watched them worship at the high places and worship Yeshirah. No trust. That they're not mentioned in the text. But think about those people who made these idols. They couldn't be trusted. Why? They led the people into captivity. They led the people astray. No, no trust in them. Jeremiah 17 is full of folks who could not be trusted. Think about this. I struggled about how to word this. I'm going to put it this way. God Himself trusted men who proved to be untrustworthy. Yes, God knew they were going to be trustworthy. God is bigger than they. Trust is in God, not men. But yet, God put people in positions of trust and they failed the test. Think about Aaron, the one God made the first high priest build a golden calf. Oh, here's the God who brought you up out of Egypt. Let's come, bow down and worship Him. And he led the people astray. Saul, the first king, disobeyed the Lord and God removed him as king of his people. Jeroboam, son of Nebat, the first king of the northern kingdom, the one God plucked up and said, you're my king. Made golden calves so the people would not go down to Jerusalem to worship. Led the people astray. And as you read the history of the northern kingdom of Israel, you'll read this king followed in the shoes of Jeroboam son Nebat and made Israel sin. What about Jonah? Prophet. God gave him a task. Ran away and shirked his responsibility. Judas, one of Jesus' disciples, Apostles. Remember, Jesus sent out the twelve and He gave them power to heal, to cast out demons. Those Judas had miraculous powers. Jesus gave them to Him. And yet He betrayed the Lord. He couldn't be trusted. The Lord put people in positions of trust and they failed the test. Men cannot be trusted. There are those who have disappointed you. People who have hurt you. Who have broken your trust. Think about that for a second. And just think about that for a second. I, I don't want you to, to, to get called up here. and You need to be forgiving and not harbor resentment. So, so we need to be careful here. But by the same token, 
it doesn't take you much thought to come up with people who have hurt you in the past by betraying trust. People can't be trusted. You know why? All men are sinners. Romans 3 9. All, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. Romans 3 10. None is righteous. No, not one. We are all sinners. And don't forget this. Even when no sin is involved, people still make mistakes. We are imperfect, we are human, and even when we do not sin, we can make mistakes. Think about David and Nathan. David wanted to build a temple for the Lord. He calls Nathan to him. And says, I want to build this temple. Nathan says, 2 Samuel 7, 3, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. The prophet says, David, go ahead. God is with you. That very night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. And said, no, 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 no. David is not to build my temple. He's a man of war. His son will build it. Not David. No sin on Nathan's part. Nathan didn't sin when he said, go build the temple, David. None. No sin. But yet he was wrong. Now, I don't need to remind you of how many times you have been wrong without being sinful. Well, I sent RJ to McDonald's the other morning. Wanted a bacon, egg, and cheese biscuit. I, I, that's the best thing McDonald's does, in my opinion. And I, I sent him a text. I said, bring me back a bacon, egg, and cheese biscuit. He brings me back a sausage, egg, cheese, McGriddle. Mistake. No sin. And then I come to find out he ordered that for himself and he ate mine on the way home and forgot what he had ordered. No sin. Mistake. We all do those things, don't we? We all do them. And it's healthy to remember we all do them. Because you just can't trust people totally and completely. There are other examples in Scripture of people who made mistakes where there is no sin involved whatsoever. We do that. Can't totally be trusted. Think about the consequences of trusting in men rather than trusting in God. Think about the context of Jeremiah 17. I always like to keep things in context. We're talking this and applying it. Let's think about the context of Jeremiah 17. People going into captivity. That is the consequence of their sin. That's the consequence of their trusting men rather than trusting God. They're, they're going into captivity. They're going to suffer. They're headed to captivity. And do you understand? Trusting in men still leads to heartache. Trusting in men leads to heartache. Jesus trusted Judas. I, I know that may be hard to swallow to put it that way, but think about it. He gave him authority over demons. He gave him the authority to heal. He sent him out to preach the message of the kingdom. Jesus, at least, brothers and sisters, put Judas in a position of trust. And Judas came and kissed him on the cheek and said, this is the one you need to arrest and heal. A woman called Jezebel and Thyatira 
Surely that wasn't her real name. Was teaching and seducing the Lord's servants to sin, Revelation 2, 20. She was seducing them, convincing them to sin that she couldn't be trusted. And because the people trusted them, they were going to be cast in the great tribulation unless they repented. They trusted her that she was a heretic. And therefore, they were being led astray and trusting her to their detriment, to their peril. Trusting men can lead to damnation. We don't put trust in men. Not in the politician. Not in the preacher. Not in the doctor. Not in a spouse or a child or a parent. It's not where we put our trust. It's not where we put our hope and our confidence. Rather, we put our hope and our confidence in God. And to do so, think for a moment of what trusting in God really means. What does it really mean? God has showed himself trustworthy in the context of Jeremiah 17. God said in Jeremiah 17, you're going into captivity. Well, guess what? They went to captivity for 70 years because that's what God said would happen. God could be trusted. God said it. It came to pass. Simple. He can be trusted. And God has always always shown himself trustworthy. He promised an old man and an old woman they would have a son and that their son would become a great nation. Well, guess what happened? That old man and woman had a baby. Their baby grew up to be a great nation. He promised Abraham while well, Abraham was sojourning in Canaan that God would give his descendants that land. Guess what? God's descendants possessed that land. He promised King David that he would always have a descendant on the throne. The Lord Jesus reigns right now, a descendant of David. God promised King Hezekiah, as Hezekiah got nervous about the Assyrian invaders, God promised, they're not coming to you. They're not going to harm you. And guess what? They didn't, because God said that's how it's going to be. He promised to raise Jesus from the dead. And the Lord Jesus walked in that tomb and reigns to this day and lives forevermore because God said that would happen. God is trustworthy. And God has shown Himself trustworthy from eternity, brothers and sisters. Over and over and over, God has shown He can be trusted and is the only one worthy of our complete devotion and trust. He promised to build the church. And not just that. Okay? He didn't just promise to build the church. He promised to build the church in the days of the Roman Empire. When was the church established? about A.D. 29, thereabouts, in the days of the Roman Empire, just like God said to happen. God can be trustworthy. God's been trustworthy to you in your life. God has shown himself in your life. Be worthy of trust. When has God given you 
your daily bread. When has he kept you from heartache? When has he walked with you through sorrow and heartache and never left you? When has he answered your prayers? When has he forgiven you of your sins? Think about just how much He has done for you in your life and how He can be trusted in the future because He's shown Himself trustworthy in your life in the past. Is there not a one of us here this morning to whom God hasn't shown Himself trustworthy? If God hasn't shown Himself trustworthy to you, Raise your hand. That's what I thought. And we can trust Him in the future. Because He's shown Himself worthy of trust in your past. God can be trusted. This section of Scripture ends kind of a strange way. Verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. God's oracle to Jeremiah ends at verse 8 about the man trusting in God like the tree planted by the water. That, that's where the word of God ends. Jeremiah spoke this. The heart is deceitful above all things, desperately sick. Words of Jeremiah. You know, Jeremiah lamented his situation more than once. He got the name the crying prophet with reason. It was he, after all, who wrote the book of Lamentations, the book of laments. He often lamented circumstances. And this statement is a lament about what God said about trusting men. God had just said you can't trust men and, and, and Jeremiah comes back and he laments that fact. The heart, deceitful. Oh, you trust people and they, they break your heart. You just can't do it. But God answered Jeremiah's lament. And God's answer at verse 10 is this. That He searches and judges man's heart. The paraphrase. God said to Jeremiah, No, Jeremiah, you can't trust men. They're going to disappoint you. But I'm going to judge them for their unworthiness. You know, when someone proves himself untrustworthy, sinfully. I'm going to judge him. That's what God's saying. Yeah, they may hurt you. They may destroy you. They can lead you into captivity by the idols they've built. They can lead you into error by what they teach. They can break your heart. They can destroy your life. Let me tell you what, Jeremiah. I'm going to judge them in the end. and I'm going to have victory. Yes, Jeremiah, the heart's deceptive. Yes, it is sick. But I'm going to judge it. And you can put your trust in me instead of men because I'm going to judge them for their actions. And that judgment at verse 10 would be according to the fruit of his deeds. It's not just that God's going to judge. God's going to judge according to the fruits of his deeds. Uh, in context, that's the Babylonian captivity. The fruits of their deeds for which they'll be judged are the idols. They're going to be taken to Babylon for it. But you know the truth. God still judges according to the fruit of the man's deeds. 2 Corinthians 5.10 We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ 
so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Judged according to works. Judged according to what we have done in the body, whether it be good or evil. You're going to stand before the throne of God Almighty, the throne of His Son, to whom He has delegated the authority to judge. And you're going to answer for your deeds, for what you have done in the body, whether good or or evil. Revelation 20, 13. John saw the dead judged according to what they had done. Not haphazardly, not willy-nilly, but according to what they had done. And one day, you are going to be judged based on what you have done. It's just fact. The question before you this morning is what that's judgments today. Could be. Are you ready to be judged according to what you have done? Or the changes you need to make in your life. You need to come this morning. Begin a life really anew of trusting in God and being like that tree planted by the water. If you need to come this morning, why don't you come right now and understand and see.